Okay, so we want to thank everyone for being here today in person and online. This is our fourth speaker, uh, seminar guest speaker. Um, we have one more next week, which will be the last guest speaker for this semester. And that will be about green chemistry by John Warner. He's one of the uh, movers and shakers in green chemistry. Today, our speaker comes from down the road in Notre Dame in South Bend. Notre Dame. Yes. It's a city unto itself. <laughs> uh, Graham, I'm pretty sure Graham would, would agree. It's a universe to itself. <laughs> Hey, uh, you know, either way, I'd have. like to, um, I'd like to have some of what they have. I, I'm not, I'm not. <laughs> exactly. Anyway, so our speaker for today is Graham Peasley. Is that correct? That's correct. And he's a professor of physics at the University of Notre Dame. Um, his active research is in applied nuclear science, and he brings established nuclear measurement techniques to environmental issues like PFAS. Most notably, uh, that includes the rapid detection of local fluorine as a surrogate for PFAS. Um, he has over 230 publications, most with student authors. And I believe you were a professor at Hope College. I think I saw that somewhere. Yes, I spent 20 years at Hope College. My previous life, yes, <laughs> at Hope College. 20? 20 years at Hope. Um, he's, earned a, he's earned a bachelor's degree in chemistry from Princeton. University, a PhD in chemical physics from the State University of New York in Stony Brook. So it's an honor and a privilege to have him here with us today. And we turn it over to you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, you can all hear me? Yes, we can. I'll try not to, to fade away. But it's an it's a honor to be here. I'm a, a very thank you for inviting me. And uh, my first role, I'll, I'll put up some outline of what I'm going to talk about. And uh, the idea will be that uh, I'll cover these topics over the next 40 minutes and have some, some time for questions, I hope, at the end. Uh, but first, I'll start with an introduction as to why I'm here and why are chemists listening to a physics professor talk about environmental science. That seems a little convoluted. So okay. we'll start there and we'll work, out, we'll work upwards. Uh, I'm a nuclear chemist by training, uh, which means I drive a particle accelerator for a living, and I have done that for a long time. And uh, particle accelerators are typically in the domain of physics, and so I learn a lot of physics, but I also look at multi-body phenomena. We, we take the nuclear force and break it apart, and so that means lots of nucleons, and that's chemistry. And so there are a bunch of nuclear chemists that do this. And uh, oh, about 25 years of basic research under my belt there, and then I went and uh, started moonlighting a little bit of on the side. I, was, I always had an interest in environmental science. So we started doing some of that. And it started with a polluted lake up in Michigan. And then it went from there. As you keep your eyes and ears open as sort of a, a liberally trained scientist, you begin learning other sciences, the skills and disciplines. There's you know, enough geology to get in trouble, enough biology to get in trouble. And you, you, take it, you take your chemistry and your physics wherever it'll go. And this is a sort of strange path that not everybody's going to follow. But I'd like to show how I did it and uh, what results we're having right now, because it really opens a whole new world for a student trying to figure out where you go. So I'll do that. Um, I'm going to do it through the vehicle of PFAS. Uh, we've done several different contaminants, but PFAS is by and large the largest one we've ever faced. And so I'm going to explain what they are and, and why you should care. And then how do we measure them? Because the world does it one way and our research group does it a different way. And so that's why it's it's different and makes a lot of news these days. So we're, we're going to talk about that. And I'll give you some results on what we've done with consumer product testing as well as contaminated groundwater, both of which are huge avenues for our future work. And I hope to leave you at the end of the time with some uh, take home messages um, and uh, tell you what you can do with this. Oops, looks like I've frozen. Uh, you can still hear me? Yes, we are hearing you still. Uh, yeah, Excellent. 
The so, camera sometimes overheats on this thing. I'm gonna I'm gonna leave my face there. At least I don't have my mouth open. That's good. And okay. I'm I'm still here. <laughs> um, and so I'm gonna start with PFAS. And it is a uh, acronym for polyfluor poly or perfluorinated uh, uh, alkyl substances. And there's an example of one right there on the screen with a lot of green dots referring to fluorine carbon backbone. So that's the alkyl chain. And then you have an end group in this case. So it's a carboxylic acid, C double bond, COOH. And they're all made around World War II. They're all man-made. Uh, somebody discovered by accident in World War II. And they have a array of names that we've called them over the years, like uh, organofluorines or PFCs originally, but more correctly, they're called per and polyfluoro now uh, alkyl substances, and they've earned the moniker now, the forever chemicals. So if you haven't heard of these chemicals before, you may have seen in the newspaper reference to forever chemicals. Um, they have absolutely amazing surfactants, uh, uh, surfactant properties in the sense that one end of it is lipophilic and one of it is uh, uh, hydrophilic. And so it really loves the non-polar end group to stick in with fats and the, the polar uh, end group to stick in with water. And so this could be air-water interfaces. This could be lipid bilayers in, in, in mammals. Um, and we use them industrially in over 200 different processes or, or consumer use. Uh, and there's lots of them. There's, there's over 12,000 of them, we'll find out. But they're used in uh, carpets, textiles. Here's a few example: non-stick cookware. Uh, it's Teflon. That's a good PFAS. Carpets have, have uh, Scotch guard. You can pour things on carpets and doesn't soak in. Paints, papers, cosmetics, coatings, lubricants, flame retardants. Um, and some examples there are the firefighting foams and the, the carpets and the Gore-Tex jackets. Uh, but also microwave popcorn. Okay. How many people have had microwave popcorn? I suspect a good number. Um, what's the first thing you see when you cook microwave popcorn and cut the top open? What comes out of it? Yellowish steam. steam. Steam, excellent. So where did that steam come from? It's actually released from the kernels when you cook it with the microwave. The microwave heats the water molecules, becomes steam. That's why they pop. And as good chemists, would you put steam in a paper bag? No. So why doesn't it get soggy? Uh, that's that's the question. And so that is because we've now coated the inside of all microwave popcorn bags with uh, no less than these wonderful lipophilic uh, oh. one end lipophilic chemicals. And that's a, and then we heat it to 200 degrees and we eat it. Is that a good place to put your man-made chemicals? Probably not. And so we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, what makes them so good? It's this wonderful surfactant nature of one end of it being really polar, one end of it being really nonpolar and the incredible strength of the single bond, the carbon fluorine single bond. So that is the highest, if you go into your periodic table or for the general chemistry textbook of all the bond strengths, that's got the highest single bond strength of any known bond. You can get a couple double, triple bonds more stronger, but this is, this is a very strong bond. In fact, it's so strong that it doesn't come apart. And um, that's the problem. So these carbon fluorine bonds are very hard to break for exactly the same reason which means compounds made with them tend to last hundreds, if not thousands of years in the environment. There's no bug or microbe that's gonna eat this thing. It's like when you eat celery, you use up more calories and you gain back. So there's no enthalpic reason to get a, a, a microbe to eat these things. And I had dinner last night with Peter Jaffe from Princeton, who was the only person who've gotten a bug to eat some of this stuff. And they only ate about 10% and they were in very low pH. I mean, it's horribly hard to do. And so there's no hope that bugs are gonna eat this stuff. And there's no, another way of saying that correctly is there's no biotic or abiotic degradation pathways. These things last forever. They got environmental persistence galore. And that's what makes them the problem. Because if they have environmental persistence, they pass right through our wastewater treatment systems. We can release them from firefighting foam. I think you can see my mouse up here. Uh, I'm not sure you can see that actually. Uh, here you go. You can see that maybe. There's a firefighting foam that's directly released. You can see that? Yes. Yes. Oh, good. Okay. And it's, it's, I can make it red, but I don't know how to remember that, do that. But it's also on food packaging that you might. Hmm. Yeah. 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 Well, let me see if I could call him. Yeah. Yeah. 
This is the office. He's in a, the office, but he might be trying to um, get back on. Yeah, with technology, we have to be prepared for everything. Yeah, so guess what? You know, from my point of view, the chemists are the ones that develop this, chemists who have to figure out how to do it. Right? So we'll use the physics. I mean, I'll just say, you can still get rid of it. Right, that's the right. So what you do to get rid of it is part of uh, hmm. I think I think it, uh, he may have shut uh, off his right. phone. I mean, how do you the floor? You burn it. Burn it. Things are everywhere. This very good. So uh, this is what we're facing in the U.S. And the the point of all the things I had told you was that these chemicals are tremendously uh, persistent and they're polluting the US uh, in great numbers. Uh, so this is the current uh, from environmental working group, a list of where they think their pollution is. But more importantly is if we know that they come on any military base or any sort of place they've used aqueous film forming foams, these firefighting foams, this is what the presumptive uh, contamination sites look like in the US. And there is no place that escapes this in the drinking water or in our air or in uh, in the foods and drink uh, water that we drink. So this is quite frankly the largest environmental problem the US has ever faced. And yeah. that's why I'm talking about it. Uh, we have uh, a chemical that we don't know how to get rid of, and it's in everything. And uh, it has, of course, adverse health effects. It bioaccumulates. This is the number of health publications per year, 1,400 of them that mentioned PFAS and human health implications in the last year. I can't read 1,400 publications in a single year. So this is this is uh, extremely worrisome. And there's a list of diseases here that I won't go through, but these are all proven links. Um, and uh, the there is a, a, a quite a, frankly, a, a growing awareness of this problem. It is, if I wanted to make a comparison, everybody knows what global warming is, right? That mm -hmm. is a very serious problem that is intractable and that we're really gonna have to work hard to do. That's very pressing. This is probably second only to global warming in its consideration, the PFAS, uh, mm -hmm. because we have poisoned all of ourselves. Everybody has it in their blood. Uh, everybody in this audience has it in their blood. The last blood sample we have found without it in it was from a Korean War uh, blood bank. And so everybody since that time has been developed about five parts per billion in their blood. Um, how do you measure it? So the traditional way to do that is to hook a graduate student, I mean, handcuff a graduate student to the LCMS spec for several hours a day, where she takes these samples and, and runs them through an, a chromatography column and then a triple quadruple uh, a mass spectrometer. And it's a very uh, a time intensive process, but you get beautiful results, part per trillion sensitivity. And our particular sam uh, has excellent sensitivity down to a single part per trillion of about 30 to 50 things that are, are measured. Um, we use in mass label standards to make sure we have 100% recovery. And it, we can quantify between 30 and 50 of these, these uh, uh, compounds. The uh, problem is that we, uh, it's very time consuming. It's uh, five hours to analyze the data typically, and it's another couple hours to prepare each of the samples, uh, and then 20 minutes per sample to run through. And it only quantifies those 20 or 30 that we have in the library, or 50 in the library, as compared to the 12,000 that are out there. So here's the premise of what my research group is and why we do it differently. 
which is what if we could screen for fluorine as a surrogate for PFAS? These compounds have you know 30 to 60 percent fluorine capability, and not there's not a lot of other fluorine out there. Could we use this as a handheld fluorometer where they look at looking for lead in uh, toys coming from China? And it's a very quick device to find out if lead's there. Then they you know shouldn't you shouldn't lick it. Uh, same thing with here. We use light as an excitation source on a sample. We measure either UV vis or FTIR, NMR. All those don't work with fluorine for various reasons. Uh, there is no UV vis transition, for example, and the NMR and FTIR are not sensitive enough. So we go with this gamma ray, and everybody's familiar in nuclear chemistry with gamma ray spectroscopy. And all we need is an excitation source, and this is our facility down at Notre Dame. It's a three million volt tandem band to graph accelerator, the big blue tank. It's an ion source, put hydrogen into it and helium and a few other things. But we can run through to our beam line, and at the other end, we bring out the well, the thing we do differently is we bring the beam out into air, and we can put a wheel of targets, and we can rotate through them at three minutes apiece, and we can get these beautiful spectra where the proton excites the nucleus. It doesn't change its nature; it just sort of rearranges the nucleons, and as they uh, decay, as in atomic spectroscopy, we get a nuclear decay uh, um, de excitation, and that results in an emission of very characteristic gamma rays, and those gamma rays will identify fluorine very sensitively. And so we, and also with very few interference, no interferences. I mean, these are two aluminum lines and they're a mile apart from the two gamma rays. The, the outside two are the, are the fluorine ones. So what can you do if you have this, uh, this screening technique? And this is what we've done for the last, oh, now five years. We've taken it to all sorts of consumer products, so student driven often. Students said, what's in my Jimmy John's wrapper? And we stuck it in the beam. And lo and behold, we went through and did 450 packages from around the country. Uh, food pa fast food packaging, we published an article saying about a third of them had PFAS in them. And it's sort of like the microwave popcorn. Nobody knew it, though, before. And everybody was concerned about what they eat. Well, you don't eat the wrappers, but you do, if you don't eat them directly, you will throw the wrappers in the waste. And as you know, aerobic digestion of these papers will release 100% of the PFAS into the wastewater. So we're all drinking the wrappers. Uh, it's just it takes 60 days later. Whereas when we published this story, an interesting thing happened. Um, we had uh, a U.S. senator write uh, letters to the 20 companies we surveyed. The president of McDonald's, Starbucks, Panera, all of them got this letter saying, we understand from the, Wall uh, from the Washington Post that you uh, use PFAS in your packaging. A, what's your company's policy for removing it? And B, how soon will you do it? Please respond, uh, Senator Durbin. And so this was a very interesting phenomenon because within 18 months, all 20 of those companies had switched away from it. They all stopped using it. None of them admitted to using them except McDonald's. And they thought they had already removed it, but they forgot the French fry boxes. But everybody else got rid of it. And they changed in 18 months for fear of litigation. If somebody finds out you put a carcinogen in their packaging and they sell tacos, they sell hamburgers, they sell pastries, they don't want to get in the business of what's in the wrapper. So they just switched to a cheaper and more readily available one, which is a plastic lined paper. Um, that's what we're using nowadays. But this was my first foray into having a science publication actually drive policy. And it was amazing that that happened and we sort of stumbled into it, but we continued and we weren't uh, our next series of publications. This was again back a few years in 2021. We did a series of three publications on firefighter textiles. Firefighters are occupationally opposed, uh, exposed to PFAS because of the firefighting foams, but they also are wearing gear that are coated and actually built from PFAS and not, not just one, but two layers of it. And so this was unknown to the firefighters, uh, except for one uh, spouse of a firefighter wrote to me and said, could my husband's cancer be related to this? And absolutely it could. We hope it isn't, but we did a study in these studies. And again, the International Association of Firefighters did 180 degree about face, and they've actually now forced all the manufacturers to not start offering PFAS free turnout gear. And that's a huge change in a, a very small, it's a small industry. It's only uh, 1.2 million firefighters in this country. But they're all going to get safer gear as a result of this. And then we, you know, the story goes on. We did a publication on cosmetics. This one went absolutely viral. You thought people were attached to their hamburgers. You should see how many people are attached to their cosmetics. And the same argument is made in the, in the diagram here. You could get a direct absorption through the waterproof mascara or the lip paint. It could go, you could easily absorb that into your body. But most of it gets tossed in the, in the waste when you leave the lid off one night. And that waste will actually wash it all through and it doesn't keep in the landfill. It comes back in to be ingestion. So we're all drinking everybody's cosmetics from the other year. And the question is, how many of them have PFAS? And it was almost 50% in this case of certain types, the long lasting and the waterproof mascaras, things like that. And so this had a huge industry uh, response. 
uh, both Revlon and L'Oreal announced last year in Paris that they are going to remove PFAS intentionally used in 80,000 of their products, mm. uh, which is not bad for single paper, but they're not doing it because of the paper. They're doing it be because they didn't know they were using it and they don't want to get sued, which is a very reasonable approach. And uh, it will, it, there will be, there are regulations now on the food packaging. There's four states that have regulations and California is adding one next year. So five states will have regulations forbidding PFAS in food packaging. But most of us, most of the states, for example, Michigan and Indiana haven't gotten there yet. Uh, those states aren't going to regulate. They're going to just, uh, the lawyers will have a field day with the states that do. And that drives the companies away from it. And we've published on, uh, of course, they're in textiles, they're in school uniforms. Uh, we did this really neat science one where we did the first observed offloading of PFAS into the fish egg. Uh, don't eat caviar. But more importantly, we saw maternal offloading, which means that the PFAS uh, uh, was eliminated from the female, but the males remained with high PFAS counts. And we're doing a whole study a study of over 800 fish from the Great Lakes. And um um, deciding, you know, whether we should use European standards or American standards to eat them uh, gives you a different answer on about 96% of the fish, uh, which is interesting. So I use those as examples of what you can do when you develop a screening test that, test that nobody else has. Um, and there's a good role for it. It's sensitive. We we measured on solid surfaces in in, in air. Um, we're rapid. We ran 5,000 samples last year, um, and all in less than three minutes. And there's no spectroscopic interferences. It's It's an ideal spectroscopy for this does have a couple drawbacks. All techniques do. Ours is that it requires a big blue accelerator and an, an operator. And there's Yukon, who's one of my graduate students who operates it. Um, and you have to be able to quantify total fluorine. And uh, that means that you have inorganic fluoride that could sneak in there. You know, if you put fluoride in drinking water, how do you distinguish it from organofluorine, which is the organofluorine is the PFAS, which we're concerned with. Um, so we try to address both those things. And uh, I'm going to give you, uh, we've lost a, a slide here, but one of the things we, we've done is we've uh, just gotten contracted to do a, um, a portable piggy. We're going to put piggy in the back of a truck, and it's a not a big accelerator like this, but a bench top, and it's going to be run without a, a, a PhD scientist. It's going to be a turnkey system, so it's an instrument you turn on off. It's expensive. It's going to cost a million dollars a pop. But we think that those new ones, which we're, we're building the first prototype in the next 14 months, is going to run about 100,000 samples a year without, without anybody but a, a BS technician running it, which is going to have a real game-changing effect on how you survey and look for PFAS. To go with that, we've come up with this you know, uh, solid phase extraction technique, which involved at first two liter pop bottles and this remarkable chemical here, uh, uh, GAC felt. This is a uh, graphitized activated carbon felt, which you pour water through. And if you if you drained uh, enough water through it, you'd catch enough fluorine on it that you could measure it right from the surface with our technique. And we started getting detection limits around uh, 20 nanograms per liter or 20 parts per trillion for all organofluorine, not just the ones that LCMS spec looks for, um, for a one gallon sample. And that, and it's linear, it's published already, the technique is published. And we spun off a company this year uh, to actually do this commercially, to try and take a whole bunch of samples. The idea being that there's only a few contaminated sites in the country, even though there were lots of them on the map, there's a lot of drinking water that isn't contaminated. And you don't want to waste time on the LC mass spec looking for zero. If there's no fluorine, don't bother doing pursuing further analysis. And the ones that have got a signal, those are the ones that need to be sent off to LC mass spec land. Well, how do you distinguish between organic and inorganic fluorine? And we figured out a way, our graduate students figured out a way to do that too. You can separate inorganic from organic with methanol. Uh, uh, inorganic is insoluble in methanol, but the, the PFAS will actually be rinsed from this. It's a non-destructive technique. So these, these PFAS are removed. We can actually analyze them subsequently. You see beautiful plots of this is the PFAS before, all got washed off, whereas the sodium fluoride doesn't. And so you can make mixtures and sure enough, just the sodium fluoride remains. But if I, if I go over here, this is the idea we're now proceeding to use our accelerator. We measure them. We do a methanol wash and we send some directly to the LC mass spec. But we look, we measure them twice. We measure them once as it comes in and measure them a second time since it's a non-destructive technique. You, the difference between the two is what the inorganic PFAS is that's there versus the total fluorine, which is going to be the, the all the fluorine minus the inorganic will give you the organofluorine, the PFAS. It's complicated, but it's doable and it's quick. We have to do two three-minute runs instead of one, but that still beats the LC mass spec by about five hours. And so this is where we think there's a competitive advantage. 
But we did some early testing. And the first thing we noticed, and this is where science comes in again, it's, it's accelerated science or environmental science or physics. I don't know what it is. But we started doing these tests from around the country. And the, the EPA test, the, the LC mass spec test, observed low numbers. And we observed things that are really radically higher. We didn't run that one in Oscoda for some reason. Uh, but the most of them were higher, except for this one site in Alaska, which was very high to begin with. These are in parts per trillion. The drinking water limit's now set to four next year. So this is, you know, uh, you know, uh, a long 30 times higher than the, the limit you should be drinking. And that one was very close to the same value. Whereas all of these were 10, 20, 40 times, even 50 times higher than what was supposed to be there. Uh, I've noticed I've frozen again. Um, but the um, this reminds us of a paper we published many years ago that there's really a lot of fluorine that isn't measured by the one percent of the that's identified by LC mass spec, and it took us several years to understand what it was. We thought there was maybe some industrial precursors that we don't know what they are, so we don't look for them, and we're missing them. But it's still annoying that there's like so much of it missing. And then last year, I wish I had published this, but this was the set of Germans that found out that in a ger drinking German water supply, this is a, a seminal paper. They, they did a very clever uh, technique of looking at the drinking water, and they found that 98% of the fluorine is in PFAS that we don't measure. They're in this ultra short chain, weird looking PFAS that we don't have in the library, and nobody's been looking for them. Yes. So imagine trying to regulate on less than 1% of the total of PFAS that's out there. Uh, and and some of them, for example, this iron right here, it's a very weird one. I, I can't even pronounce the name of it. It's got a, a, a CF3 group, CF3 group attached to a sulfonate attached to an amide. And that happens to be the counter iron in every lithium ion battery. You have lithium and you have need a counter negative ion. It's these ion ions that are in there. And of course, when these cell phones hit the uh, landfill, they're releasing this into the environment. Um, and so all of these are not measured by LC mass spec. But guess what? <laughs> our little bags are able to measure enough of them. They don't stick to our felt very well either. They're only 10 to 20% efficient. But we, they're so, in such abundance, 100 times higher than anything else, that we see them. And that's why our samples are 30 to 40 times higher. And, you know, 40 times higher is that we see 96% of the, of the flooring being this. And uh, we've observed that in northern Indiana and now in California. And so we're pretty convinced our water looks like the water around the rest of the world. And we have, for the last 20 years, missed it. We didn't realize these things were there. And the conference I was at yesterday was quite literally a whole bunch of people playing catch up with, oh my gosh, what does this mean? They're completely unregulated and nobody's done any toxicity testing on it. But it's not going to be non-toxic either. This is scary. And this is an example of what we're doing. We're taking a, a sending out a $1 bag and a felt that fits in a cap. And we have residents do their own water. Here's my graduate student at a hotel room draining it all into the, into the, into the they drain it through the filter and in into the tub. And then you get it back to uh, where you need to be. And we've actually gotten a little more clever. We can uh, remove the C2s and C3s by going the other way. Instead of using methanol, we wash the inner, the or, uh, ionic parts off. And the sodium fluoride is totally ionic. But the sh ultra short chains with only C1, 2, or 3 fluorines are very ionic in nature too. So with a little bit of nitric acid, we can wash those off selectively. Uh, almost all of them come off with a simple five millimeter wash of after we've collected it. And yet if you have PFOA, it doesn't come off at all with nitric acid. It sticks more tightly, in fact. And so for our real world samples, this is what we're imagining. We take these caps. We don't have to send water bottles back and forth to the lab anymore on ice, which is the way people do PFAS at the moment. And that's why it costs $400. We are going to send out a dollar a bag and a, and a 15 cent cap, have people pour their own gallon through, send it back in. We'll wash it with nitric before we get it if we don't want to see the ultra shorts. And we'll just tell them how much is left of the longer chain PFAS. And this is something that, although the accelerator costs a lot of money, if I can do 100,000 of these things a year, uh, I can make the cost considerably less than anything we're looking for with the LCM aspect. And just as an example, my student, Yukon, who's doing this as part of a thesis, is driving around northern Indiana, testing it. And um, and this is a, a preliminary results from northern Indiana. And you can see that most of the circles are pretty small. These are numbers higher than you'd like to see in drinking water, but this is for all of them. So divide by about 40 or 25 to 40, and you realize that this is a two. And so these are really quite drinkable in terms of what the EPA limits are. But we're starting to get one spot that's high. Um, and this is this is uh, also corresponds very nicely with what the... Uh, yeah. 
Okay, so how do you know that? Hello. Yeah. Hello yes, we did. Okay. I know. Uh, <laughs> unbelievable. Okay. Uh, something's wrong in there. Let me uh, go back see if I can. Connect. Okay. Um, I'm still locked in. It was me just going, but I will log out in a second. Okay. Um, there it goes. Time um, I watched it. Uh, yeah. Um, I'm not sure either. Um, where did we leave off? So where did we leave off? We were at, uh, what was the last slide we were on again? Uh, the little circles that have the concentration of it, the yeah, what your graduate students were yeah, student in northern, northern, northern Indiana. Indiana. Yeah, I actually know it, so we caught it pretty quick this time. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. I will do that. I'm I'm on my computer, so I, I'll uh, be able to get there quickly. Hold oh. on a second. Okay. Thank you so much. I'm not gonna tell. Have them send over a few, <laughs> a few golden helmets. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. New rock. that could that could build us a new, uh, a new science building. Yeah, some of those golden helmets. To be perfectly frank, this is a great science building. in terms of, terms of durability. Add on to that. What we need is Oh, yeah, addition, addition. How about a new right? It's taken a while for him to get back on. I don't know if he knows he's not that bad. Okay. All right. Not yet. Uh. Okay. Admit. Admit. There we go. All right. There we go. Okay. The good news is I can skip to my conclusions. <laughs> okay. Touchdown. Uh, <laughs> I probably have to share that screen again. Let's do that. But this is where we left off, I hope. Yes. Yes, perfect. Uh-huh. Very good. So we went and confirmed that this test works. Uh, we're in the middle of scaling up to do larger and bigger, bigger studies. But I was going to leave you with this idea of uh, inventing a new uh, 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 technique and what you can get away from it. So I'll just end with a couple of conclusions. Um, one is that there's an awful lot of PFAS out there, and if anybody wants about five lifetimes of opportunity of employment, getting into PFAS and understanding how to do it or greener chemistry alternatives or how to remediate it, the uh, Department of Defense is giving a million dollars to anybody who knows how to remediate this stuff, and you know, people are guessing. Um, but there's also this new ultra-short PFAS, which is a totally new topic just this year, and uh, a lot of other things to consider. Uh, any sort of total fluorine measurements like ones we're doing you know, are can be used as screen for it, but you have to understand what all that extra fluorine means. And it leads to a lot of new science, which is not necessarily physics. But this is now in the realm of well, fate and transport of, of environmental toxins. Um, and more importantly for us, there are a lot of products that we use that contain PFAS because the industry has put them out there. And there are multiple pathways from uh, these products into our bodies, which isn't good. And so there's a role for piggy this is particle induced gamma ray emission pj in, in french but piggy sounds good um to do product and drinking water surveys and that's what we're asking to do we do um uh, field deployable is what we're hoping to get to and it really will be a rapid bench test when we get it all finalized in the next year or two um for the students as a scientist in training 
we are not taught how to communicate communi uh, these sort of uh, these sort of events than we when we stumble into something like this uh, to a broader public. Not very often are we taught that directly. And so I would earn you, uh, urge you to study the science first, but also learn how to communicate and mm -hmm. uh, keep that keep that communication open. You can have very positive results. We're actually influencing science, which is science policy, which is uh, remarkable. Uh, because most companies do the right thing if they're given the option of, whoops, this is going to be toxic and that isn't. Guess what? They, they generally do the right thing. Um, we can all make better choices as individuals. I've now gotten rid of my Teflon pans. Uh, but as scientists, we also have an obligation, I feel, that we if we discover something of societal value, it's up to us to communicate it and communicate it clearly and not, not alarmism. But also uh, don't be afraid to communicate it because even if it upsets people, it needs to be told. And that's when applications of your science have some sort of import. Learn how to do that. And I'm learning how to talk to reporters. They say it a lot better than I do, as it turns out. Um, and I will just end by thanking all the people who did this work. Uh, those are my graduate students hold there. Uh, recently graduated Heather, and uh, she's now at the EPA. And Tony and Alyssa and Yukon and Gunnar are, are the ones, and several, uh, many undergraduates I didn't list, that contributed in the funding agencies that got us there. My email address is there. Uh, I'm afraid I may have gone over time, but if there are any questions you'd like to answer, ask, I can do that too. All right. Well, first of all, thank you very much. We modeled through this. Um, yeah. I have a question. Um, are you in conversation? Is the EPA interested in using your method? Oh, yes. Uh, okay. I went down to North Carolina last week, and, and they're very interested in total organofluorine methods. Um, they're suspicious that none of them will work exactly right. And they're right. There's a lot of there's a lot of caveats with all of that we can measure. The biggest concern is, can you distinguish organofluorine from non-organofluorine? And that's what our most recent efforts have been. We've now figured out how to do that. And so we're publishing that. Then we're going to try to do actually an EPA method number for it. Uh, it's a single lab verification method, but they do that. And uh, what's new for them is a screening method. This is not for total quantification, but for screening where it is and where it isn't. And even if it doesn't uh, get EPA blessing, which I think it will, I think it'll take a couple of years. I think people will start using it practically because it will save you a lot of time and, and, and money in the field, which is what the Department of Defense is interested in. Okay. Anybody online or in person has a question? Um, I have another one. I mm -hmm. noticed that there was a high, by, by both methods, the EPA method, your method, there was a high uh, uh, concentration of PFAS in Alaska. Yes. Do you have any sort of insights into why? And um, do you know which part of the US has the highest? Is it Alaska or? Um, the primary culprit in the environmental poisoning has been firefighting foam. And the firefighting foam has been used for 50 years. This particular type of firefighting foam has been used for 50 years by the U.S. military. And there are 2,300 U.S. military bases in the U.S. Uh, the, some of them are closed and some of them are still active. But every day that they're active, they put uh, they test the fire suppression system, especially if they have an airport or any, or any sort of fuel tanks. And so, and for 50 years, they were told this is perfectly safe as soap. So they just poured it overboard or they put it into the ground. And Alaska has not one, but um, dozens of military bases, of course. Oh. And so it is a, it's a native community that surrounds a U.S. military base. And uh, it's been pouring off the runways for for decades. And it's wow. gotten into the drinking water. So that's the issue for most of the sites. The other ones that are big are industrial. If you have a 3M plant or a DuPont plant nearby, like Wilmington, Delaware, uh, it's downstream, Wilmington, North Carolina, sorry, uh, downstream from the Cape Fear watershed. What a great name for a chemical spill. Cape Fear watershed in North Carolina. There's That's over a million people that have drunk the, the Gen X chemicals that DuPont put in that water. And that's a, that's a, that's a huge catastrophe because uh, they've been drinking it for 18 years and we don't know what the health effects are, uh, but we know that there are some. Um, so I think that this is just, the, there's a lot of these stories in the news now and people will start seeing the forever chemicals being mentioned but it's we don't really know how to sequester them or destroy them. Incineration will work, but we've put a halt to that till we know what temperature incineration we need because you don't want to release more out. You want it completely mineralized. Okay. Um, I have one last question. I know people are ready to leave, but I'm interested in this question. Um, sure. So you, you started with a huge room size <laughs> instrument now yep. it's a benchtop instrument. 
is, does the technique, uh, the use of these, is it gamma rays allow mm -hmm. you to maybe go s even smaller? Well, the trouble is that we are using a proton beam to generate the gamma rays. And you need something with a few MeV. We we operated about four million electron volts, four MeV of energy, mm -hmm. and that will get you enough gamma rays to measure very easily. The trouble with going smaller is it's it, you can't get much smaller than the one the little RFQ we have on a benchtop scale. That's about the smallest accelerator that'll give us that much energy with it with a flux of beam that we can measure. And so um, that's I think that for the foreseeable future that's the size. That's uh, and. And that's that we found a company that was already making them for another purpose. And we asked them to repurpose for this environmental one. Okay. And they are eagerly doing so, but we needed some money to do it. And of course, because the Department of Defense is the one funding most of this research because of their environmental concerns, uh, they're also afraid of the communities litigating with them. Um, then they are funding us to try and get this, this speed up technology on the ground. Okay. All right. Very good. Thank you very much. You're still welcome to come to Andrews anytime. Very good. Thank um, you. Uh, uh, what, what, once Willis you figure out what the internet Andrews. connection is. I didn't hear you. Uh, once we fix our internet connection, it shouldn't have the same issue, but I don't know what it was. So. <laughs> yes, yes. Yes. Yeah, so tell Anthony hi for us. Yes. I will do so. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Very nice. Thank you, All guys. Right. My email's there if anybody wants to uh, send me questions. I, I'm happy to answer them, too. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you.